working now? Yes. Good. Uh, now you see it? Uh, yes. Okay, great. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, the web ontology language or uh, OWL. And uh, first of all, I just want to follow up real briefly uh, to the question that someone asked uh, from my previous talk. Uh, so I did a little bit of looking and I, I found it's a, it's a rather dated article, but I, I, I think it might be still fairly interesting. It's called The Semantic Web, A New Tool for Librarians. And I, I created a tiny URL there. Uh, so if people want to follow that and go check it out, uh, I think that might be uh, of interest uh, uh, and relevant to that, the question that I was asked. Um, also, I wanted to mention there's a vocabulary. So I, by now, I think, I, I hope people have come across the term uh, vocabulary, which is the idea of a, an ontology that's been designed to be reusable and to be used in um, a number of different uh, domain uh, uh, ontologies. And um, one vocabulary that I think is worth checking out that's relate, related to library science is the prov vocabulary. Uh, and it's, it covers things like um, uh, versions of a document, uh, who's edited the documents, uh, um, the different kinds of media and things like that. And another vocabulary that you, you've probably heard of, I'm, I'm, I imagine most people are already familiar with, but I just thought I'd mention is Dublin Core. I mean, of all the vocabularies, that's that and a friend of a friend are probably the two most popular and the most widely used. And obviously Dublin Core uh, deals with metadata, author, date created, things like that. Again, I think very relevant to, um, uh, to library sciences. And DBpedia is something that I recommend if, if people haven't checked out that, uh, that you take a look at that. Uh, it's a great resource uh, for uh, just general information. I mentioned um, the Watson system from IBM in my previous talk and DBpedia was one of the main uh, knowledge bases that they used to uh, uh, get, get the um, uh, questions for the uh, 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 for Jeopardy, um, and uh, uh, also uh, there's something called the Simple Knowledge Organization System or SCOS. Now, this one I don't have as much experience with, um, but from what, I, what little I do know, I, I think that also might be fairly relevant to library science. So that's just just a, some quick ideas I had. Uh, uh, based on the, the last question I had in my previous talk. Okay, so now to get to the actual meat of the talk, what I'm gonna talk about is the web ontology language. And so this is showing where we're at now in terms of the stack, we're kind of in the middle. The web ontology language is the thing that brings semantics into the, uh, on top of the, the graph language. And uh, there's also, uh, you also need to have a reasoner in order to get the full power of the web ontology language. And for this workshop, we're, we're going to be using the pellet uh, reasoner. So um, the foundation for all, of course, is RDF and RDFS. So everything in all is represented as triples in RDF and RDFS. So for example, when you do the tutorial and you create a class called pizza in Protege, what the protege editor is doing for you is doing things like it's creating the triple uh, pizza colon pizza, RDF colon type and owl colon class. So pizza is of type class. Or when say you create a subclass of pizza called named pizza, uh, protege creates a triple uh, named pizza, RDFS subclass of uh, pizza. Now the, the prefixes in those uh, triples uh, such as RDFS and pizza and RDF are namespace prefixes, just as you would find in programming languages, uh, just as you have namespaces like in Java and in Python. And the reason for using them is the same as the reason you use them in languages like Java and Python. You want to be able to reuse uh, different models, different uh, libraries, but without worrying about uh, potential name conflicts. And uh, the name class is actually a good example here. So um, I have that, you know, when you create a, an owl class, you create an instance of the type owl colon class. However, there's actually also a class in RDFS. 
uh, and it's a, a less powerful class, but it still it you know it still has some of the properties of a class. So because you also need to use RDFS um, when you're creating your ontology, um, you need to have both of those ontologies uh, in, uh, loaded together. And in order to distinguish that you want to create an OWL class as opposed to an RDFS class, that's, that's an example of where you need to use these namespace uh, prefixes. Uh, one thing that's nice about Protege though, is that for the most part, um, you won't have to worry about prefixes at all because what Protege does for you is it creates a, um, a, 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 an, a an empty string prefix for the, the ontology that you're working on. So essentially, you'll see everything as if there is no prefix, uh, but um, you know because that's that's a little bit of extra uh, 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 work that Protege is doing to make things uh, simpler for you. Okay, so what Al does is it adds formal semantics on top of RDFS, RDF, and RDFS. So the the those lower uh, those languages RDF and RDFS give you uh, the graph structure. What Al does is it adds formal semantics on top of the graph, and that's that's why we call it a knowledge graph because it's it's a graph, but it's also with semantics on top of it. So Al is an implementation of something called description logic which is a subset of first order logic. Uh, and now description logic predates all, um, it was created a, a while back by people in the database community. And it was pre precisely to solve the same problem that Al was trying to solve, which is they wanted to have a language uh, that could be used to formally describe uh, data. And that's what Al does as well. And there's different variants of description logic and hence, there's also different variants of OWL. Um, and in, in OWL, these variations or variants are called profiles. Uh, this again is something that, you know, I'm just giving that, just letting you know that they're out there. You won't need to worry about profiles. Where profiles come in primarily is when you're uh, working with very large knowledge graphs, like with millions and millions of triples, then sometimes you may want to scale back a little bit of the uh, reasoning capability in order to get better performance. And if you recall, this this uh, goes back to that uh, principle I was talking about in in my talk too. The fundamental trade-off in knowledge representation and reasoning: the more of first-order logic you have, the slower your reasoner uh, is going to tend to be. So, uh, as a compromise for really large ontologies, sometimes people will use OWL profiles that don't have the complete uh, uh, capabilities uh, that uh, normal OWL does. But again, uh, you won't really need to worry about that in anything that we'll be doing in this workshop. Uh, the other point is that uh, both first order logic and description logic, they're all they're based on uh, set theory. So I imagine everyone or most people know this, but just in, to, to, to make sure everyone's on the same page, a set is just an unordered collection of non-repeating elements. So there's two kinds of ways you can describe a set, an implicit definition or an explicit definition. An, ex an implicit definition is using some uh, formal language to give a description of uh, the set. Uh, so the, the, the first two examples I have here are implicit definitions of the same set, just using different, uh, 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 different uh, formalisms. Um, so it says for all X, uh, the, the set such that it X is a natural number and X is greater than one and X is less than four. Uh, the other way to represent sets is via explicit definitions. And in that, in, with an explicit definition, you just list all the elements of the set. Uh, the, the implicit definition is also, is often more, more, more powerful, uh, but the explicit definition can be useful as well. And when we do the tutorial, we'll mostly be dealing with implicit definitions using description logic um, and the semantic web rule language. But there will also be one example where we have an explicit definition of a set that uh, that's the uh, the spiciness uh, class. That one will 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 be an example of uh, uh, an explicit definition of a set. And that that's that's that a set that's or a class that's defined. Uh, explicitly is called an enumerated class in OWL. 
Okay, so I'll implement all the basic constructs and operations of set theory. And um, uh, since we're running a little bit of late of time, I'm, I'm not going to go, uh, I'm not going to name every one of these because this is, I'm going to go into each one of these in detail in, in my presentation. So to start with um, some basic uh, set theoretic constructs. So uh, one thing, and you may have noticed I'm doing this, I've been doing this already is I will, I will sometimes switch back and forth between using the term set and class. And uh, I apologize for that, but it's just, it's so ingrained in my brain that set and class are exactly the same concept. So um, you can use them interchangeably and they mean exactly the same thing. Um, but in, in the term that we use in all is we call them a class. Um, and in the same, same way, subset and subclass um, and superset and superclass are also interchangeable. They mean the same thing. Uh, and, and again, in all the term, terminology we use is subclass and superclass. Oh, um, this one is, there's, there's a couple, there's someone in the waiting room. Um, I, can, I don't know how to let them in. Sir, I have left them in. You can continue okay. with your talk. Okay. okay, good, 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 good. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, uh, so uh, the empty, uh, uh, another important uh, concept in set theory is something called the empty set. Uh, and that's just the set with, uh, that has no element. Um, and in, in uh, OWL, the empty set is represented by a special class called OWL nothing. So no individual can be an instance of all nothing and no class um, other than all nothing itself can be a subclass of all nothing. And on the other hand, all nothing is a subclass of every class, including itself. And sort of, sort of the uh, diametric opposite of all nothing is all thing, which, or which uh, is the, the universal set. Um, so uh, whereas no, no individual can be an instance of all nothing. Every individual is an instance of all thing. Um, whereas no class can be a subclass of all nothing. Um, every class is a subclass of all thing and no class is a superclass of all thing. Um, so now I'm gonna go into some of the other concepts in, in the following diagrams, the circles are classes and the diamonds are uh, individuals. Uh, so here's an example for, of two classes from the pizza tutorial, low calorie pizza and vegetarian pizza. And down at the bottom, those are uh, examples of implicit definitions of a class. And those are uh, examples using the description logic language that you will be using uh, in protege uh, in, in the tutorial. So a low calorie pizza is a pizza that has caloric content which is uh, less than 400. That's uh, essentially what that statement says. Uh, so pizza has caloric content, some XSD integer, which is less than 400. That, that turns out it, what that means is just, it, uh, it has uh, a property that is caloric content that is less than 400. Um, and vegetarian pizza is defined as a pizza which has topping, um, only a cheese topping or, only, or a veg uh, vegetable topping. And then you, you can see, so that's the things on the bottom. Those are the implicit definitions of the class. Uh, we also call those axioms that define the class. Um, and uh, the, the diamonds represent instances uh, of the, uh, each one of those classes. Uh, okay, so now the next um, concept I wanna talk about is set intersection. Um, so intersection, means and, uh, the intersection of set A and set B is the set of all elements that are um, in A and B. Uh, so in this case, I'm showing two classes, spicy pizza and vegetarian pizza. And uh, I'm showing, you know, there's, there's some, the, there's instances of both classes and there's uh, a couple of instances, uh, namely hot veggie pizza one and hot veggie pizza two that are instances of both classes. So those are instances of the intersection of the two classes. Um, in all, we use and to express set intersection. So when we're writing an axiom and we want to talk about the intersection between two classes, 
we say, so for example, if we wanted to have an axiom that described the intersection of spicy pizza and vegetarian pizza, we would just say spicy pizza and vegetarian pizza. pizza. And that's the intersection um, of the two. Um, set union um, means or. So uh, set union is uh, the union of a set A and set B is all the elements that are in A or in B or in both of them. Uh, so in OWL, we use or to define the union of two classes. So for example, if I wanted to say um, the union of spicy pizza and vegetarian pizza, I would use the, the description logic term uh, expression spicy pizza or vegetarian pizza. Um, another concept is a disjoint set or disjoint classes. A disjoint set is a set, uh, or two set, or two sets are disjoint if their intersection is the empty set. In other words, uh, two disjoint sets or two disjoint classes are classes that uh, can have no, uh, there can't be any instance that's an instance of both of those classes. Uh, and by the way, uh, just to clarify, also instance and individual, those are also uh, synonymous terms. Uh, I use instance when I'm talking about like an instance of a class. I say individual when I'm just talking about a specific individual without necessarily talking about what, what uh, classes that uh, individual is an instance of. Uh, and by the way, the, uh, the previous speaker mentioned about how uh, it was important that, that uh, hierarchies, you know, that, were, that are limited to uh, only having a uh, single inheritance were, were, in, were inherently limited in terms of modeling the real world, which I thought that was a great point. And I just want to emphasize that that is not a constraint of OWL. That, that, that is a constraint in a lot of object-oriented programming languages. You're either uh, unable to or you're strongly discouraged from using multiple inheritance in um, most object-oriented programming languages. But in OWL, uh, you definitely can and you often do use uh, multiple inheritance inheritance, you can have um, an individual be an instance of two or more classes, and it's a very powerful way to uh, model uh, the world. So again, getting back to disjoint sets or disjoint classes, two classes are disjoint if they can never have uh, any instances that are um, uh, uh, an instance of both classes. Uh, I, I imagine most people know already, but so subset, it means the same as subclass. Superset means the same as superclass. And um, when I'm talking about uh, a subclass, I'm getting more specific. So, uh, and when I talk about a pizza, uh, <laughs> when I talk about a superclass, I'm getting more general. So uh, pizza is in this, in this diagram is the most uh, general class. So pizza is a superclass of vegetarian pizza. Vegetarian pizza is a superclass of medium veggie pizza and hot veggie pizza. And then, you know, you can go um, in the opposite direction as well. You can say um, uh, medium veggie pizza is a subclass of vegetarian pizza and so on. Now, here's some examples from the tutorial that you're gonna do. So I'm, I'm kind of giving you a sneak peek at some of the, some of the uh, uh, things that you'll be creating, but just to, to clarify, you know, uh, uh, what, these, what these terms will look like when you see them in the protege uh, uh, ontology editor. So uh, the, the one thing you, you will notice is that all the classes are subclasses of all thing, um, as, as I mentioned. Um, and also uh, uh, pizza, uh, so pizza, pizza base and pizza topping are all subclasses of all thing. Um, and then I can further decompose um, pizza base into thin and crispy base and um, uh, uh, deep pan base, and those two are also subclasses of pizza base. Uh, to specify a disjoint classes in Protege, you use the uh, description view um, in the uh, class uh, hierarchy tab. And so as you can see here, I'm specifying that pizza and pizza topping are disjoint classes to uh, pizza base. And one of the good things about uh, Protege and having the reasoner is it does a lot of work uh, for you. 
So in this example, uh, once I specify that pizza and pizza topping are disjoint with pizza base, then I run the reasoner. If I went and I looked at pizza or pizza topping, I would see that they also had the correct um, definitions for the, uh, uh, the, disjoint, the disjoint classes um, on them already. I don't have to go and specify them on every class. I just specify them on one class and the reasoner will propagate um, those, and this is called an axiom, will propagate those axioms to um, the other relevant classes as well. Now, the last concept from set theory I wanna talk about is relations. So relations can be thought of as uh, a set of tuples. So for a set, order doesn't matter, but for a tuple, order does matter. Uh, and uh, tuples have a fixed number of elements. Uh, the most common kind of relation is a binary relation or a binary tuple. Um, and they can be written, as I've written them here, like element one and element two. So for example, I could have a relation uh, or a binary tuple called has car, which um, consisted of uh, individuals from uh, per the, the person class and related to individuals of the car class. So for example, I would say John Doe has car BMW one, Mary Smith has car Prius one. So uh, for a binary relation or a property, there's a set that defines the legal values for the first and element and the legal values for the second element. So in this example, the, and those are called, sorry, those are called domain and range respectively. So in this example, uh, has car, the domain is person. So in other words, the thing that, that you can assert the, the property about, that is what the domain is. The things that actually get asserted that's what the range is. So in this example of has car, uh, the domain is person and the range uh, is car. Um, in, and uh, I've already been using the term property. So in all relations are called properties. From this point on, I'll try to stick to using the term property. But again, it's, it's synonymous with relations. They're uh, really the same thing. Uh, actually, well, there is one difference, which is that in set theory, you can have n area relationships. So you, you're not just limited to having binary relationships, you can have uh, ternary relationships or uh, quad, I don't know how to, how to pronounce it, but four area relationships or as many, or any, you know, as many uh, uh, kind of things you wanted to relate as, as you wanted to. But for reasons of efficiency, the only kind of properties you have are binary properties. You can't have ternary or other properties. So however, that's not as much of a constraint as you would think because there's actually a very standard uh, design pattern that can be used to decompose an n-ary property like a ternary property or even a higher level property into a uh, number of uh, uh, binary properties and with additional classes. And if you see the bibliography, there's uh, a link to um, a page on my blog uh, where I, uh, describe um, uh, how to represent uh, an example of using uh, decomposing n uh, pr uh properties to uh, binary properties. And I think we'll also cover uh, as such an example in the tutorial as well. So in uh, OWL, there are three kinds of uh, properties. There are object properties, there are data properties, and there are annotation properties. Uh, so for an object property, uh, the domain is a class and the range must be a class. So, uh, and you could, in other words, you can only, and you can only assert them uh, uh, object properties on individuals. So, you know, again, getting back to that has car uh, uh, property, that was an example of an object property where the domain was the class person, the range was the class uh, car, and then the things that you asserted on were instances of those class. So you assert on instances of the person class that that person is, has the has car uh, property to some uh, instance of the car class. Uh, data properties, uh, the domain must also be a class, but the range instead of being a class must be a data type. 
Um, a lot of times for reasons of efficiency, you know, we don't want to re represent things like strings or numbers as uh, full-fledged uh, classes. So we use uh, predefined data types. And Protege comes with a built-in set of data types that uh, come that are imported from XML. And that is why uh, I think all of the uh, built-in data types that you'll use in the uh, tutorial, and in fact, most of the built-in data types that you will use whenever you develop an ontology will have the uh, namespace prefix XSD. And that's it comes from XML. So things like XSD string, XSD date time, XSD integer, and XSD decimal. Um, and again, data properties can only be asserted on individuals. Uh, so uh, you might have a, a data property like uh, has number of cars. Uh, so we, uh, the domain on that would be uh, a person and the range would be um, XSD integer to uh, define the number of cars that a person has. Now, finally, annotation properties are, are different. Uh, for an annotation property, the domain can be any entity. Oh, and just uh, to clarify, so when, uh, by entity, I mean essentially anything in all. So entity is like the umbrella term that I use, or not just I, that, that people in the community use for um, any uh, owl concept at all. So a property, a class, an individual, um, a rule. Whenever we, when we say entity, it can be any or all of those things. So an annotation property uh, can be asserted on any entity at all. And, and, and the, the range for an annotation property is, is usually a data type, but actually it can also be um, a class. Um, and uh, uh, the, uh, the reason that annotation properties can be asserted on anything, not just on individu individuals, is that they're typically used for metadata. And you know, so for metadata, um, things like uh, um, what was the source for this particular uh, bit of data, we don't wanna limit our metadata obviously only to individuals. We also wanted to apply to uh, uh, classes and to all the entities that are in uh, the ontology. Um, and one of the standard uh, annotation properties is um, RDFS label, which is like um, a, a, a string that can be uh, more uh, user-friendly than the, uh, the, IR, the name you have for the IRI. Um, another common, very common annotation property is uh, uh, comment. Um, and you know, there's many others as well. And also you can create new annotation properties just as you can create new data properties or object properties. Um, properties have relation characteristics that can be um, defined in OWL. And I think um, I'm gonna just skip onto the, uh, the next slide because uh, I think it's easier to just see the graphic representation of these characteristics rather than just talking about them. So one kind of characteristic is an inverse property. So if uh, I say um, Susan Doe, or if I have a property called has father, the inverse of that is is father of. So if someone is in the has father uh, property going one direction, then they're in the uh, that that other individual is going to be in the is father of going in the other direction. So in this example, I say Susan Doe has father John Doe. When that means, and because is father of and has father are inverses, that means that John Doe is father of Susan Doe. And um, all of these characteristics can be um, inferred automatically for you by the reasoner. So for example, if you, if you define uh, has father and is father of as inverse properties, and you asserted that, um, uh, Susan Doe has father John Doe, and then you ran the reasoner, the reasoner would automatically infer that um, John Doe is father of Susan Doe. You wouldn't have to define it. And one of the things when I was, when I first started using Protege, one of the, the kind of pleasant surprises I had is that I would often go to enter some data that I thought I needed to enter only to find that the reasoner had already filled it in for me. So uh, the reasoner can you know, do a lot of work for you. Um, and it's one of the reasons uh, I believe it's a good idea to run the reasoner uh, often. Um, 
uh, okay, so now getting back to the properties, another kind of property is a symmetric property. So an example of a symmetric property is, is has sibling. If, if I have someone that's my sibling, they, they also have me as their sibling. So in this example, if I say uh, Susan Doe has sibling Steve Doe, and if I say that um, has sibling is a symmetric property, then the uh, reasoner will automatically infer that Steve Doe has sibling Susan Doe. Um, another kind of property is called a transitive property. And the easiest way to think of a transitive property is to think of the greater than and less than relationship in mathematics. So if X is less than Y and Y is less than Z, then X is less than Z. That, that's what a transitive property means. And uh, in this example, I'm showing an example of a transitive property that uh, you will define in the pizza tutorial called is spicier than. And so is spicier than is transitive. And so when you define in the pizza tutorial uh, that uh, hot is spicier than medium and medium is spicier than mild, then the reasoner will automatically infer for you that hot is also spicier than uh, mild. And in this example, it's not that impressive, but you know, when you get to transitive properties uh, with larger numbers of individuals, it can um, uh, uh, do a lot of work for you. In fact, I, I have an ontology that I've developed for representing uh, values uh, 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 with, with units. So representing things like five miles per hour or uh, five miles per second per second. And uh, I use transitive properties a lot in the, that ontology. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that example uh, a little bit more um, later on. Uh, then uh, the final kind of property is a reflexive property. And um, uh, example, uh, that just means that the, the property always uh, refers to, uh, the property always holds for itself. So example of that is within OWL, there's a property called OWL uh, same as. And the reason we, they have that property is that it's possible to have two different, two individuals that come from different definitions. So for example, individuals that uh, where you may have gotten the da data from different databases or something. But in reality, uh, it turns out that semantically, those two individuals really represent the same thing. And so if you want to say that in OWL, you can do that using the OWL same as uh, property. And obviously that's a reflexive property because um, any individual is always the same as itself. Uh, again, in mathematics, this is uh, um, the same as saying uh, uh, the equal to relationship. Any number is always equal to itself. Uh, so equal to is a reflexive property. Um, now, in, um, when you define uh, properties in uh, protege, uh, you use the uh, properties tab, which is what I'm showing you here. And in that tab, um, there is a, um, uh, a view uh, called uh, the characteristics, which I have circled here, um, where that you can use to define um, all of these different properties. So in this example, I'm defining that um, uh, uh, is spicier than is a uh, transitive uh, property. Oh. One other uh, characteristic I didn't mention is functional. And that means, again, the same thing as it means in mathematics. Uh, if a property is functional, that means that it can have at most one value uh, from its range. It's the same thing as saying like uh, it has a um, uh, max cardinality uh, of one. Uh, and you'll see there's also a few other characteristics here that I didn't bother uh, defining because I think the, the, it's, it's rather obvious from uh, their, the, the, their names, you know, um, and understanding what the other properties are, uh, what they are. So for example, uh, uh, an asymmetric property is just a, a property that's not, that is explicitly not symmetric. Um, you can also define inverses in, uh, in this uh, tab, uh, which I'm showing here. I've defined that um, is, is, is milder than is the inverse property of is spicier than. So um, if I define that, uh, that uh, something is 
uh, spicier, if X is spicier than Y, then the reasoner will automatically infer that Y is milder than X. Now, you can also have super and sub properties. Since properties are sets of tuples, they can be subsets and supersets of each other, just as classes can. And this is one of the big differences between properties in OWL and properties in object-oriented programming. And uh, there's also other important differences between not just properties, but just between uh, object-oriented objects in object-oriented programming and objects in OWL. And especially for people who are object-oriented programmers, there's a, uh, a reference in the bibliography called um, a semantic web primer for object-oriented software developers that I strongly encourage any object-oriented programmers to go and read because um, it, it, at least speaking from my own experience, when I first came to uh, start using, uh, 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 using Protege, I had been an, uh, an object-oriented programmer for a long time and I came with a lot of preconceptions and so th this document helps clarify, uh, you know, what some of the differences are, and there are some important differences. And so one of them is this concept of sub and super um, properties. So um, just as in for classes, all classes are subclasses of owl thing. There's a uh, uh, owl property called owl top object property that is the super property for all object properties. So all pro object properties are uh, have one super property, which is our top object property. Um, and this example here is from the Kodo ontology, which shows uh, some of the power of using super um, and sub properties. So um, I've got a, a property called has relationship and then that property has a bunch of sub properties. So um, when two uh, people are coworkers, they also have a relationship with each other. When uh, someone is the child of another person, they have a relationship with each other. So what, what the property hierarchy does is it allows me to one, specify information at the level of granularity that I have it at. And this is useful uh, in a lot of databases and for example in Kodo because we get data from different data sources sometimes that data is very specific it'll say that um, patient uh, patient one is a is the daughter of patient two and sometimes that information is very general it'll just say patient one has a relationship with patient two and with with these uh, sub and super properties we can specify it at whatever level of granularity we have it at but um, if we specify it at the lower level of granularity. So if I say that um, uh, Joe has daughter Mary, then the reasoner will automatically infer that Joe has child Mary and Joe has relationship uh, with Mary. Um, I wanna talk a bit uh, about uh, naming conventions. So there's different standards for naming all entities. Um, and I said, as I said, an all entity, anything, uh, a class, an individual, a property is, that's what we mean by an entity. So there's different naming standards. Um, the specific standard is not important. What is important is to, to pick a standard and to stick with it. Um, having said that though, uh, the, fo the following things I'm gonna say, these are things that I do highly recommend that people adhere to um, in their naming conventions. Um, so one of them is to use the singular tense for the class. So for example, if you've got a class called that represents the, 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 the class of all people, you, you call it, the standard is that you would call it the person class rather than the people class. Um, when we define the class for pizzas, we call it the pizza class rather than the pizzas class. Um, another standard is that you capitalize the first letter um, of the name of classes and individual. And if the name requires multiple words, you capitalize uh, each word. So for example, uh, pizza, uh, cap capital P, or, or pizza base, you capitalize the P and the B. Now, where there's a lot more leeway is in this kind of where you have multiple words for the name of the class. The way I'm doing it, um, and the way I did it in the tutorial is more sort of the old school way of doing it, 
where you, you just don't even, you don't have anything in between the, uh, the two words. I think the way people are, tend to do it these days is they tend to put an underscore uh, in between. So they tend to have pizza underscore, uh, um, uh, an underscore and then uh, base. Uh, as I said, you can do it whatever way you want to. Um, what's important is to stick to a standard and, and or is to pick a standard and stick to it. So I use this standard partly because it's the standard that I started using because it was the standard that people were using when I first started using Protege. Uh, also, I use the standard because I'm lazy and uh, it saves me from writing an extra character of an underscore. Um, uh, the, uh, another standard that I highly recommend people adhere to is that um, you begin the name of properties with a lowercase as opposed to an uppercase um, uh, letter. So for example, uh, you, you, if you'll notice, I've, I've been doing that uh, in my previous examples. So for when I have properties like has ingredient or is ingredient of, um, the first letter is um, uh, lowercase and then, all the, then the other uh, letters are uppercase. And again, with the same thing here, if you want to use underscores or um, you can even use spaces, I recommend not using spaces. Technically, Protege can deal with spaces, but in my experience, spaces can sometimes cause problems. I would recommend using um, either nothing or uh, either smushing all the words together if you're lazy like me and you don't wanna type an extra underscore, or if you want better readability, um, then use an underscore. Um, and another uh, naming convention that I recommend people try to adhere to as much as possible, although it's not always possible. Um, in fact, we don't always do it. Uh, it you'll, if you'll notice in, in the Codo ontology, you'll see that there's a lot of cases where we didn't stick to it, but as much as possible, I recommend sticking to this naming convention. And that is you use, um, you start the names of properties with has, and then um, you start the names of their inverses with is. So for example, you call um, pr the property has father and you call its inverse is father of. Uh, and the same way you would call the property has mother and its inverse is mother of. And the reason for this, it, it may seem a little bit, you know, um, esoteric, why, why does it matter? Um, I think you'll see as you start to write the axioms to define classes, um, you'll see that sticking to this, this um, convention will make the axioms uh, much more readable than uh, if, you, if you don't use this uh, convention. So now bringing it all together, um, you use uh, this, uh, what, this language called description logic to define um, classes. And the, th the, the uh, expressions that you write um, with description logic are called axioms. So there's three kinds of classes in OWL, uh, primitive classes, defined classes, and anonymous classes. So primitive classes are classes either that have no axioms on them or only have uh, necessary axioms. In other words, um, for a primitive class, any um, logical axiom I've described, if I say that something is an instance of that class, that axiom must hold uh, for that, that individual. However, for a primitive class, if I see that some individual um, satisfies the axioms for um, that, that, that primitive class, the reasoner will not make that individual an instance of that class. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's a common uh, uh, issue I see with a lot of new users is they'll define uh, their axioms on a class and then they'll wonder why uh, an individual that satisfies the axioms is not being classified as an instance of that class. And the reason is that you have to make sure that you're defining them uh, not just as necessary axioms, but necessary and sufficient axioms. And when you define them as necessary and sufficient axioms, that's what we mean by a defined class. Um, and for a defined class, if the reasoner finds an instance that satisfies all the defined classes axioms, it will automatically infer that that individual is an instance of that class. Um, and you'll see that in the user interface, these are shown, um, the defined classes have three horizontal stripes going through the, the orange circle next to the name of the class. And then the final name, uh, or the final kind of class um, is uh, an anonymous class. 
Now, these are classes that are defined implicitly via uh, some description logic axiom, but they don't show up in the class hierarchy, but they will show up if you do uh, various kinds of queries like um, later on, uh, not, not today, but in, a, in another day in the tutorial, we're gonna go through using the uh, Sparkle queries and using description logic queries. And in those queries, those kinds of queries, you will see anonymous classes uh, showing up. So I'm, now I'm gonna talk about some of the most important description logic um, operators. Uh, so the first one is the sum operator. So for those of you who know uh, first order logic, uh, the sum operator is equivalent to existential quantification. Um, it means one or more. So for example, if I say uh, cheesy pizza is a pizza and has topping, some cheese topping, it means that anything that has at least one cheese topping uh, is a uh, cheesy pizza. Um, min and max operators are used to define the number of individuals that are associated with a class. So for example, in the tutorial, we're going to define um, a create a defined class called interesting pizza and say uh, it's a pizza that has topping min three pizza toppings. So in other words, any, any pizza that has three or more pizza toppings is an interesting pizza. And you'll see uh, in the tutorial how the reasoner will automatically classify uh, pizzas with, with three or more toppings as interesting pizzas. Um, the only operator is, uh, for those of you uh, familiar with first order logic, is the equivalent of universal quantification. It means, whereas the, ex the uh, sum operator means uh, one or more values, the only operator means all legal values. So for example, um, we're gonna define vegetarian pizza as a pizza that has topping only cheese topping or vegetable topping. So that means the only kinds of, that, that all the, the toppings for um, a vegetarian pizza must either be cheese toppings or vegetable toppings, no other kinds of toppings. Uh, now I'm gonna just show you some examples in the user interface of these kinds of classes. So here um, you can see pizza, pizza topping, pizza base. Uh, these are all uh, primitive uh, classes that we'll define in uh, the tutorial. Um, uh, vegetarian pizza and hot veggie pizza and medium veggie pizza, these are defined classes and you can see that they're, they've got those three um, horizontal stripes uh, across them. And you can also see that if you look over to the right in the description pane, uh, where it says equivalent to pizza and has topping only cheese topping or vegetable topping, that's when you have the axiom uh, in the equivalent to field, that means it's the axiom is a necessary and sufficient axiom. When you have axioms in the subclass of field, that means it's only a necessary um, axiom, which will mean it's still a primitive class, not a defined class. And um, you can create defined classes either by uh, explicit, just put, putting the axioms in the equivalent to field directly, or what we're gonna do in the tutorial is there's an operation to convert something from a primitive class to a defined class. And what it does is it automatically moves the axioms up into the equivalent to field for you. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I've, I've already covered this. So um, the defined class uh, has its axioms in the equivalent to field. Um, and here, this is an example of an, 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 excuse me, an anonymous class. So when I say cheese topping or vegetable topping, that is creating um, an, an, an anonymous class that is the union of the classes cheese topping and vegetable topping. Okay, um, that's, that's it. Um, and um, uh, here's uh, the, bib my bibli the bibliography. And as I said, I, I, um, I, I, I point object-oriented developers to the uh, semantic web primer for object-oriented software developers. And uh, if you're interested in any area relations, I've got some things there from the W3C as well as from my blog. Um, are, are there any questions?